G'day lads and gentlemen, welcome to Draw with Jazza, I'm Jazza, and this is a video tutorial on how to draw people wielding weapons. The weapons I'll be using in this video are going to be more the medieval type, like swords and axes and stuff, but the general principles apply across the board, and not exclusively with weapons either, but we're going to take that specific approach and you can apply the lessons you learn in any situation you would like. I'm looking forward to jumping into this lesson, we're going to have loads of fun, but before I do I just want to mention that there's a helpful resource pack that you guys might be interested in. I developed what I call the Anatomy Pose and Reference Pack, which is a photograph pack of a male and female model in which I've isolated references of different muscle structures and anatomy parts. But the reason I mention it and bring it up is because throughout the pack, there are hundreds of different poses all taken on four angles and many of these poses have weapons, ranging from things like swords and axes and bows and arrows to things like guns and spears. Years. So if you're interested in drawing lots of intent character driven uh, action scenes with weapons This reference pack might be something you'd be interested in so make sure to click the link on the screen and in the description to go check it out All right, so let's get started as you can see This is a character and a sword I've prepared beforehand and we're going to be talking about a way to put the two together in a way that's not only convincing, but dynamic and interesting. So the first things first, if I take my hero over here and I take this sword and put it in his hand, surely this does the trick. Sadly, it does not. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of elements to it. It's not a simple equation when you're drawing a hero with a weapon. It's not a simple one plus two, man plus sword, job done. It's a bit more of a complex equation involving things like weight distribution and intention of movement. So before I take time to go through those things individually, I'm just gonna give an example on this image as to what I mean. One, weight distribution. Without this sword present, our weight distribution is in the center of the character, meaning that in this stance, the distribution of weight throughout his entire physical body is completely centered, it's right in the middle. However, when we add something like this, things tip a little bit. You see, even if this is a heavily muscled, powerful, strong man capable of carrying such a sword, this sword is quite heavy. And so we're adding a lot of weight here pulling this side of the man sort of downwards, pulling our center of gravity to his right. On top of that, it's not just weight distribution that centers on the wrist, because you see the center of weight on the sword isn't actually at the wrist. They try and center it, of course, they add a pommel and they make sure it's more weighted at the base, but at the end of the day, you have this hunking great bar of steel that is projected away from the body and therefore you have all this weight all the way along here at quite a distance away from his center of gravity, further pulling him down. So that is the first point we're gonna talk about. Weight distribution. I have terrible handwriting. The next thing we're gonna be discussing is the intention of movement. As you can see, our character here doesn't seem to be going to or from any particular position. His shoulders are completely square. His arms don't seem to be moving in any direction. His torso is completely straight and aligned with what his normal center of gravity would be were he not holding a weapon. His legs are completely straight and not indicating any sense of movement, whether it be walking to a particular position or resting or crouching ready for a strike or anything like that. So another one of those main points we're gonna be discussing is the intention of movement. And then finally, the last thing we need to discuss are dynamic elements. And as you can see, this pose and image completely lacks them. Everything is completely front on. There is absolutely no foreshortening. There's no sense of anything impending. There's no challenge in the art itself. If I hide all my notes here and we just look at this, if we saw this as an image, it would perhaps make a, a character concept sketch. But if we're actually trying to depict an interesting scene, it completely fails to do so. So the third thing we're gonna discuss is how to add elements of interest to whatever scenes you depict using action. 
So to illustrate the first point, which is weight distribution, I've made two copies of our hero here and I'm going to erase the large part of the sword because it does take up a lot of space and you can use your imagination to fill in the idea that it's a very long heavy object. And what I'm going to do is leave the character on my left here as a point of reference so you can see how the original pose looked and I'm going to alter the character on my right using elements of weight distribution. So first things first, we know that the center of gravity is no longer in the dead center of this character. With a very heavy object being held like this, like a sword, the first things that would normally adjust would be the arms, pulling the object in so that it comes closer to our center of gravity, holding the sword close to the chest or low to the ground. But let's say in this instance, there is a reason that the character is holding the sword out. The next thing to adjust would be the feet and the torso, particularly the feet first, and then the torso would sort of adjust to help the arms shift the sword into a position that's more bearable. So when changing the elements of the pose of the character here, the first thing to be affected is the leg that's closest to the object because it's gonna be bearing more of the weight. The muscles here and here are gonna to have to move closer to the object and are gonna be working. They're gonna be bending slightly, perhaps like this in that pose or position and the other leg will probably be straighter. The next thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna have this character's torso sort of bending forwards. The reason is because his shoulders are gonna be adjusting. His f the arm that is not carrying the weapon is actually not doing any work. So we're gonna be drawing our little stick figure here with our other arm sort of moving forwards in the direction that he might be facing. Usually this tends to be because someone holding a sword out like this is aiming in a direction ready to strike. So the other arm is used to sort of steady and aim in and towards that sort of direction. Meanwhile, the arm that is holding the sword is still out here, but the difference is holding it straight out like that is very unrealistic. Unless in the middle of a strike motion or at the very end of a strike motion, it's unlikely that someone's gonna be holding a sword with a completely straight arm out like that. So the next thing that we do is bring the arm in. Similar to how we have the leg that's holding more of the weight using its muscles by having it sort of bent and having the muscles bear the weight, we're gonna have the arm bent as well. And then we draw the head in whatever position we see reasonable. But as you can see, the entire pose is now lower to the ground than when he was standing straight and tall. And that's because the entire body is locked in and engaged to bearing the weight of this heavy object. Might even pull the leg across a little bit. And we can note that there are two more things that are happening here. We have an arc of motion in the whole body, which is adding a sense of action, which is following this sort of curve here. It's like everything's sort of being pulled back, almost like the bow of a bow and arrow. And then the other thing that's happening is the center of gravity is now positioned at the back of the body here, kind of centered around where this leg is. So I'm now gonna move this sword into a position where it sort of makes sense in regards to where the hand is. I'm still gonna have it sort of out because that's the sort of intention that we're following. But now I'm gonna draw a new version of my character using my new construction lines as a guide. So as you can see with my new example on the right here, we have a clear arc of motion, which brings interest to the piece. We also have a new center of gravity, which uh, gives a much more interesting and clear sense of weight, of a uh, physicality to our piece. Weight distribution as an element in an image affects a few things. It affects where you place limbs and how you pose your character to make it look believable, make it look like they're holding a weapon or whatever they're holding. And it also affects the way the muscles are working because every muscle has a very specific function. And in this situation, this character's left arm and leg aren't doing that much work, but his right arm and leg are doing a lot of work because there's a lot of weight bearing on this leg here. And then there's a lot of work done with the arm in particular, with the shoulder holding the arm and the weight of the sword up. And then also in the forearm, which is gonna be doing a lot of work in gripping the sword itself. 
The bicep and tricep do the work in lifting the hand up and down, but in terms of the weight bearing, the forearm is actually probably gonna be doing quite a bit more obvious work here. So whenever you draw a character gripping a very heavy weapon, make sure to indicate that in the muscles on their forearm. And if their arm is folded in, make sure to have the bicep protruding more than the tricep. And if it's stretched out, have the tricep protrude more than the bicep. The next thing we're gonna discuss is intention of movement. And I'm gonna do this through the trusty stick figure again. And the way I draw my stick figures, particularly for poses and things like this, is with a center line and a circle for the head, uh, adding the jaw. I draw a bit of an ellipse for the ribs and add a line underneath, a curved line to indicate the bottom of the rib cage. A bit of a square for the pelvis or a circle, whichever you prefer. And then I often use circles for the shoulders and then just kind of lines with little joints to indicate the limbs. And then for the hands and feet, I just use little blocks. Now doing this enables me to very simply kind of gauge if elements of a pose is working before I do much work on it. It also enables me to demonstrate some clear comparisons uh, in doing this with you today. So I'm gonna bring my initial uh, character over here on the left, just as a point of reference. And I'm then gonna create a few different poses and discuss intention of movement. And then we're gonna incorporate the previous thing we discussed in the uh, weight distribution. So let's start off with something really simple. In terms of intention of movement, let's pretend we have some sort of a warrior marching towards an enemy not yet ready to strike but with a bit of a serious intention and a combat readiness. Something that works really well is to use an arc of motion and we saw this sort of in action in our previous example here. An arc of motion is an indication of direction and movement just simply in a single stroke or line and that can be an extreme stroke or line or it can be a really simple and subtle one. So for example I'm going to use an arc of motion like this. It's uh, a little tilted forward and it's just got a slight bend to it. And in following this arc of motion, all I do is simply begin by adding the elements. So I'm gonna have his head sort of facing straight on. Then I can add my torso and then add my shoulders and limbs. And as you can see with, in terms of weight distribution, I have a few things happening here. I have my uh, right arm, which is gonna be holding the weapon higher than the left arm. So the shoulder is pulled up and that's because it's bearing weight. And my left arm is sort of aimed forwards just to help with that direction of movement. Another thing that you may notice is that in terms of weight distribution, let's say I have my character holding the sword like this, the weight distribution is still pretty low and kind of forward because the character is leaning and walking forward. So it helps give that intention of motion, knowing that the weight distribution is centered sort of around here at this point, simply because the motion is moving forward. The weight is sort of uh, giving some momentum in that direction. So we have a few clear things happening here. We have a heavier object on his hand that he's carrying while walking in a specific direction. And we can see that intention of movement in the middle pose that he's sort of in at the moment. And the fact that the weight distribution is in front of where he is actually stable during this pose. So that's a bit more of a simple example of weight distribution and intention of movement. So now let's do another example, but with a lot more interest, a lot more intention of movement. This pose on the left here is a pose that is happening before something has eventuated. It's it's the anticipation before the connection of movement of the, the direction that they're going in or of the action that they're taking. So let's do one which is right in the point of contact where the intention of movement has been achieved, but we can see where they've come from. We'll begin by drawing a much more extreme arc of motion and we're gonna have the same character as if he had just stabbed another character in the gut. But let's say the character was sitting down so it's gonna be a little bit more low so that all of the weight can be pushed into one central area which will be sort of here. So in doing that, let's begin with our head and we're gonna have the head facing the same direction. In fact, we'll have it sort of in a profile view while the rest of the body leans into this direction. Now something different that's going to be happening here is instead of having the center of gravity unsupported because in this particular example here on the left the character is not supported in the center of gravity showing that the movement is still sort of taking place this is a finished motion so we want the center of gravity to be balanced and and taken care of 
if all of the energy is, is happening here and we have what will eventually be a weapon here and his arms holding that weapon, uh, the center of gravity is most likely going to be somewhere here. So in catering to that, we're going to have one of his legs coming quite a bit forward so that that center of gravity is handled. And then his other leg is going to be, let's say, uh, bent. It makes the most sense that the leg on the side of the arm that is doing the thrusting will be going forward with that arm. Reason being is I think because it's on the same side, the, the, uh, the force behind it is greater. So the arm and the leg kind of jumping forward and thrusting at the same time uh, can sort of aid that and give it a more intense sort of look. So let's have the front arm and the front leg for something different finishing off this thrust. And I'm going to have the back arm sort of out like this because it sort of went in the other direction as the thrust was happening. If you're wondering how a pose might be done or an action might be done, it helps to stand up and do it yourself. Grab an object that you could use that has a similar sort of makeup and, and see how your body naturally moves if you're doing that and, and what where the most intense action happens, where you feel the center of gravity. It's very useful. So that's basically all I need to do for my construction lines. And then on top of that, I can draw the character um, using all of these things as a guide. So we have a finished sort of rough pose. It's still, you know, sketchy and we're just kind of getting the general idea. But as you can see, our first pose that we have here on the left looks quite incomplete because it's in the middle of the intended movement. And then the one on the right here is after the motion that was intended is complete. And we can see that it's very helpful to use things like arcs of motion and uh, to keep in mind where the center of gravity is to help us know where to position the limbs. So already these sorts of things look much more interesting and dynamic than our original character pose. We're starting to tell stories with these figures. But telling stories is one thing and telling interesting or dynamic stories is another. So with our two examples, with this and with this, with all three of the examples we've drawn up so far, everything looks very flat. Everything is very side on or front on and uh, there's not a huge amount of interest. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to attempt to draw two more extreme and interesting poses. I'll speed up through that and at the end I'm going to come back and outline a few different uh, main points that you can use to add interest to your illustrations. I'll be using the lessons that we've sort of looked at so far, those being the intention of motion, using arcs of motion and things like that, and then the weight distribution and using center of gravity. But I'm also going to be much more dramatic with the poses and have them uh, use things like foreshortening and other dynamic elements that we'll outline in the end.
Okay, so I've done a bit of a sketch here. As you can see, we have two characters that are interacting both on fairly extreme angles and in fairly extreme poses. In a shot like this, there's a lot that's very different uh, compared to the other poses that we've drawn so far holding the weapons where we did use arcs of motion and we did plan weight distribution. And uh, one of the main factors is the foreshortening that's happening. The character's no longer facing sideways against our viewing angle, but we're looking up at both of them. And I've also moved the weapons and limbs in such a way that we can see some extreme foreshortening happening. So I'm gonna divide them up a bit and I'm just gonna illustrate both. So we have this front arm here of this man, which is sort of moving towards the viewer. And then we also have the handle of this weapon, which is doing the same thing. So this is all kind of moving out in this direction. And then we have the leg, which is thrusting forward as he moves his weight forward, ready to have the ax swing. So they are the two main elements that are really coming towards us. But then in the flip side, we have this leg here, which is moving away from the player. So we actually don't see much of it. It's on a bit of an extreme tilted angle. So it's all kind of bunched up there and quite shadowy, which is uh, quite useful to use if you cover it in shadow when you don't see much of it. And then we have this ax here at the back as well. And we do have a bit of that perspective going on here. But the main focus of it is sort of pulled away from the viewer, same here. We're seeing the limb go off into the distance. So what about with this woman here? We don't have a huge amount of forward foreshortening. There is a little bit going on here in this arm and here with this leg in terms of things going in the direction of the viewer. But then for the most part, we have this leg, which is being pulled off into the distance. And then we have this arm, which is further back, but it's not really on a perspective angle. What really is though, is this arm and hand, which you don't even really see much of because both of them are pulling away from the viewer. So those are the major examples of the foreshortening and the perspective that is used on these characters to make it a lot more dynamic, to sort of pop out a bit more. There are other things as well. We can use things like motion or blurring on the weapons or on certain limbs to add a sense of drama and a sense of speed. And then of course, having an area of effect of the motion uh, so for example, rather than having just the weapon swinging, having the hair kind of flowing in a way that looks like it's kind of moving in that direction as well, that there's this over-sensing arc of motion that's carrying on throughout the entire pose. So anyway, that's all I'm gonna talk about in this video. Just to recap, we talked about things like weight distribution and then used things like arcs of motion to create our sense of intention in the movement. And then finally, we added dynamic elements of perspective and of foreshortening to bring it all together while making sure to keep in mind weight distribution and our arcs of motion. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a bit of a long one, but that is my video on uh, drawing characters with weapons. I hope you enjoyed it. You guys voted on having this video tutorial. And if you want to vote on what the next tutorial subject will be, make sure to click the link on the description and uh, go vote now. Once again, and as usual, the reference file for this tutorial is for free in the description. You can click that as well. And if you're interested, once again, and go check out the anatomy reference and pose pack so you can uh, use all those visual examples to practice and create different dynamic poses of your own. So thanks for joining me ladies and gentlemen and until next time, I'll see you later. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe to my channel to see new content every week. Check out more of my stuff by clicking the annotations over there. You can get the reference files for this tutorial by clicking the link in the description. And if you want the reference files for all the tutorials I've ever made, check out the tutorial archive. If you're looking for a great place to collaborate, explore, or share your own content, head over to newgrounds.com. That's it for now, and until next time, see you later.